Hello, and welcome to the guided submarine coral reef tour. Is everybody in? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and I make lucky number thirteen. Can everyone hear me all right? I lost my voice in a deal with the sea witch to get this job, so I'll be speaking pretty quietly for the duration of the tour. Nah, just, just kidding. I went too hard at karaoke last night. But seriously, is the microphone picking me up okay? Are the speakers at a good volume for everyone to hear me? Okay, great. If you look at the screen below your nearest porthole, it should be displaying subtitles for anyone that needs or prefers them. Alright, ladies, gentlemen, and the rest of my fellow undersea explorers, are you ready? Are your seats all dry? They better be, or else we've got a problem. There is no splash zone on this submarine unless something has gone horribly wrong. Speaking of which, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please look under your seats. You get a life vest. You get a life vest. Everybody gets a life vest. And please keep all arms and legs inside the submarine. Now, keep in mind as I'm narrating this tour for you, that different passengers will be seeing different things through their portholes, each angle shows a unique view of the ocean, the reef, and all the animals in it. So if I mention something and you don't see it, just take a look at the porthole on the other side or your neighbor's porthole and you may see it then. Now, coral reefs grow in the shallow, euphotic zone, where there is a good amount of sunlight, so we won't be going any deeper than 50 meters today. You know, before this, I used to work on a deep sea submarine but it was too much pressure. There are about 60 species of coral here in the Caribbean. Many of the organisms that you see today may look like plants, but they're actually corals, which, believe it or not, are animals. Animals, plural, in fact. Most corals are colonial organisms, which means that they're made up of hundreds of tiny animals. These animals are called polyps. So the polyp is a tiny individual creature, and a colony of polyps is a coral. All right, now there are two types of coral, largely, at this reef that you will be seeing as we explore. The first is soft corals. Now if you see something waving in the water, it looks like a plant. It is not actually a plant. There are not any seaweeds or kelps here. It is, in fact, a type of soft coral. Now, if you see something that looks kind of yellow through the water, almost like a brain, very wrinkly, that is brain coral, which is a type of hard coral or stony coral. And you should see a variety of those as we explore as well. Hundreds of years ago, coral larvae swam here and attached themselves to rocks, and slowly grew into the reef that you see today. The fastest growing corals on this reef grow at about the same speed as the hair on your heads, so fairly slowly compared to other animals like us. Do you all like to go snorkeling or scuba diving? I highly recommend doing one or both while you're here, get an even closer look at the coral. If you do, just be very, very careful not to get too close. Touching the coral can damage or even kill it. They're very fragile. Also, corals have stingers called nematocysts. They use to capture their food. So if you touch the coral with your bare skin, you will get stung. Have any of y'all been stung by a jellyfish? Yeah, in my experience, it is not fun. It's a burning, prickling, really itchy kind of pain. I do not recommend it. Jellyfish are related to corals, 
Both are of the phylum Nidaria. That is C N I D A R I A, Nidaria. There's a silent C on there, which is fun. And they sting with nematocysts too. So remember to be really careful not to touch corals, both for the sake of the environment and for yourself. Hmm? What do corals eat? That is a very good question. Corals eat a variety of foods. It mostly depends on their size, what makes up their diet. They eat zooplankton, zoo meaning animal, and plankton meaning wandering. They're mostly microscopic animals that can't swim. They just drift around in the ocean currents, hence their name. When the zooplankton happen to drift into the tiny tentacles of coral polyps, they get stung by the polyps' nematocysts and brought into the polyp's stomach to get digested. Now, larger coral polyps can eat larger animals, even small fish. How many of y'all have watched Finding Nemo? Well, we won't find him here. Clownfish are native to the Indo-Pacific region, not the Caribbean, where we are currently. Do y'all remember the part with the anemone? Sea anemone are part of the phylum Nidaria, just like corals and jellyfish. Another thing sea anemone have in common with corals is that they're part of a symbiotic relationship. The sea anemone protects the clownfish and gives them a place to live, while the clownfish helps feed the anemone. Corals have a mutually beneficial relationship like this too. Most reef corals, like the ones you're looking at now, have a symbiotic relationship with organisms called zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are a type of single-celled plankton called dinoflagellates, and the dino does not mean that they are dinosaurs. The dino actually means dynamic, spinning, and the flagellate means whip. So their name describes how they move around with a sort of propeller body part that they have. Zooxanthellae are special because they can do photosynthesis, just like plants. The corals that you can see through the porthole now actually get most of their color from the zooxanthellae that live inside of them. The zooxanthellae are colorful because that pigment helps them to absorb sunlight to perform photosynthesis. The sugars that they make through photosynthesis feed the coral, and the coral protects the zooxanthellae. If you've heard the term coral bleaching, that's when the coral loses its zooxanthellae and turns white. If the coral stays in this bleached condition for too long, it can die. This is because the coral needs the zooxanthellae for nutrients, because the water they live in, as you can see, is really clear. This is good for the zooxanthellae's photosynthesis, but it means that there's not much nutrition floating around in it for the corals to eat. Hey, do y'all know why that fish right there is crossing the reef? To get to the other tide. Okay, y'all didn't like that one. Let me try again. What do you get when you cross the Atlantic Ocean with the Titanic? About halfway. Are y'all sure that one wasn't funny? Too soon? Alright, one more. Why did the algae and the fungus get married? They took a lichen to each other. Although, unfortunately, their marriage is now on the rocks. And now, for a more serious topic, protecting the coral reefs. I already mentioned the importance of not touching corals when diving. Another way that we protect the reef here is to use a mooring system instead of anchoring our boats. Instead of dropping an anchor, which could smash the coral, we moor our boats by tying them to a fixed object like a mooring buoy. Now, this next way is a little more obvious, but not using dynamite or cyanide around the reef is another way to keep it safe. Some poachers use dynamite or cyanide fishing to catch fish for the saltwater aquarium trade. 
so please make sure to source any corals or fish for your aquariums responsibly. Pollution also affects coral reefs, of course. For example, fertilizer runoff can cause algae blooms, and the algae will start to compete with the coral for the sunlight that their zooxanthellae need to photosynthesize. Corals live in a very specific range of temperatures, from about 21 to 29 degrees Celsius, which is about 70 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Rising ocean temperatures are one of the main causes of coral bleaching. So, if you've ever heard someone say, Oh, who cares if it gets 5 degrees warmer, it's not going to change anything. Well, it actually does have a large impact on sensitive organisms like corals, which is why the climate change can be so devastating to natural environments. As you can see, there are lots of different fish that live on the reef. Now, fish are not my specialty, so I will not be naming them all for you today, except for that one. That one is Jeffrey. Jeffrey and I go way back. Hey, bud. Alright, coral reefs are one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth, up there with rainforests. Out of all the marine ecosystems, coral reefs have the most species per volume. They support thousands of species of fish, hundreds of species of corals, and thousands of other organisms, like the plankton I've told you about. This biodiversity is really important, because the more diverse an ecosystem is, the stronger it is, and it's easier for more diverse ecosystems to recover from disasters, both natural and anthropogenic, meaning caused by humans. Coral reefs like this one provide a natural barrier for coastlines, which protects the land from erosion and from storms and hurricanes. It will reduce the force of the winds as the hurricane passes over the reef. Did you know that in general, antibiotics aren't invented? They're discovered, being used by living things? That's another reason why biodiversity is so important because we can help discover so many things about each species on Earth, which can be used to help all of humanity with life-saving medicine and other innovations. Well, did you like the tour? If not, sorry, no reef funds. And that's all, folks. Thank you for joining me.